spray techniques, gun handling techniques, gun setup, air hose handling, sequencing a paint job, and we're also going to be talking about a whole lot of other things like uh, air line systems, the importance of filtration, the importance of air volume rather than air pressure. So um, the other cool thing is that below the you're going to see icons pop up talking about some of the equipment and tools that I'm going to be holding up. They're all available from Eastwood and some of them are on sale. You can find all of this stuff at Eastwood, so I just want to let you know that in advance. The other cool thing is that you can actually field questions. You can, you can talk to us and at the end of this presentation, uh, we're going to answer a, a, a few of those questions that you guys have, have asked, which is one of the beautiful things about what we're doing. We are live. It's like, it's like a news report. We're live here and it's very very cool to be a part of this. Uh, if you don't know who the heck I am, I'm Kevin Tates. I, I own and operate and produce the Paint Education series. I also do some TV shows. I do the truck show on Spike. And um, I just want to say out loud, I'm a really good painter. Now that might sound all boastful and stuff like that, but there's a reason that I can say that I'm a really good painter. Is because I've painted thousands of cars. It's not because I have God's gift of painting. You guys, anybody can be a really good painter. It's repetition, it's conscious thinking, it's muscle memory. And that's what it is. You gotta pay attention to the rules, get your setup right, and do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And practice, 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 practice. And you guys, if you're a beginner, if you're a pro, you get better. It's muscle memory. So when I say I'm a really good painter, it's because I've done it a lot. So all you gotta do to get your skills up is just practice. So let's get started. Started. Um, we're going to talk over here a little bit about air compressors. Now the air compressor is the heart of your shop. I'll say it again. Air compressor is the heart of your shop. Everything else depends 100% on the quality and the volume of air that you're putting out. Now, here's some requirements. I hope you got a notepad. If you don't, these presentations are available for download later. You can view them later on and you can take some notes because there's a lot of important things. There's a minimum that you need to paint a whole car. You need at least a five horsepower compressor, a two-stage air compressor, preferably with a cast iron pump, a minimum of a 60-gallon tank, and you're talking about spending some money you have to have the proper amount of air volume. Air pressure doesn't matter in painting anymore. Air pressure is for your tires. It's a totally different set of equipment and set of systems. Air volume, CFM is key. And when you read the guns, what they're required to have, it's CFM, it's not pressure. It's about 12 to 13 CFM. Some of them are lower drawing. Some of the Eastwood guns are drawing less. But here, here's the difference. You can have, you see the difference in the inside diameter of this and this pipe. Okay, you can have the same air pressure or the same air pressure in both of these pipes and the volume that's coming out the end of this one is much greater than the volume that's coming out the end of this one. So the volume is what atomizes and breaks up the paint. So you can breathe through a straw or you can breathe through a culvert pipe. Breathing through a culvert pipe is easier and it's easier to paint. So think of that analogy when you're setting up your air system. So now that you've got your air compressor, I wanted to show you something else. This is what I'm plumbing my main paint shop with. Um, it's it's a, a system that I got from Eastwood. It's three quarter inch uh, inside diameter airline. And the fittings are really cool. They're a push lock style fitting that has an O-ring system and a ferrule that compresses on top. And it makes, it makes short work, it makes your your uh, airline routing very, very easy. And the system that I've got has 100 feet of the blue hose. It's got several fittings, several junctions, several unions. And the cool thing is that it's flexible. So you can bypass a lot of the need for, for uh, well, look what you can do with it. And it's lightweight. It's aluminum with, with a nylon membrane. And uh, it's really versatile. So I highly recommend that. That, again, it also is available with Eastwood. Let's talk about filtration. You've got to have clean air. You've got to have lots of air, but you've got to have clean air. So this is the little ball filter that you, you can buy. And these you can screw onto the end of the paint gun. And this will filter somewhat of the debris. Uh, it's, I don't recommend just this. This helps if you've got a problem. Sometimes this can solve it on the fly. Don't depend on this to... Uh, to save your paint job. This is called a desiccant snake. It's filled with desiccant. Now we're going to explain desiccant in just a second, so hang on. 
Um, this goes in line to your air system, and it's got uh, silica inside it that will absorb moisture. It doesn't uh, compress, it doesn't interfere with your CFM delivery, so this is a nice fix if you're doing a limited amount of painting, and uh, it, it's relatively inexpensive. When they wear out, you replace them. Then you get into your different regulators and filters. This is just a regulator with a gauge on it with no filter whatsoever. This has got a filter. You can mount a gauge and mount it in line with the regulator. You gotta have a regulator to get your air pressure where you want it. This is the Mac Daddy of all of it. This is a three, it's a multi-stage desiccant system. Now desiccant is this stuff. These aren't silicone, they're silica. It's silica beads that absorb moisture and it works exceedingly well. These packets are what you get with modern electronics. When you buy a TV, when you buy a computer, they're all packed, everybody's seen these. They come flying out of the box and you throw them in the trash. They are the same thing as in this and they'll be in your canister in line in your air supply and they will filter out the moisture. This is multi-stage. These two are designed to catch particulate. This is designed to catch moisture. And you, again, you gotta have clean air. You gotta have lots of air, but you gotta have clean air. So think about systems like this. Now I wanna make something very, very clear. If you buy this stuff and you don't install it correctly, you are wasting your money. So if you're not gonna install it correctly, uh, don't, don't even bother. You know, just, you know, <laughs> um, throw caution to the wind. Here's what I'm talking about. What happens when air compresses, it's a piston, just like an engine, it superheats that air. When it comes off the manifold, it's hot. So if you put your expensive, relatively, uh, desiccant system right on the manifold or a couple of feet off the manifold, that air is still packed with moisture and it goes right over top of the filters. It doesn't get separated. So what you have to do is sit this at least 20 feet, preferably 50 feet away from that hot manifold of your air compressor. And you might be saying to yourself, I'm in a one bay garage, I want to plumb it, I'm in a small shop. I don't have 50 feet, I've only got 30 foot walls. Here's something. Now don't plumb with PVC, I want to say that out loud right off the bat. This is PVC and I made this piece just for demonstration purposes. So what you can do to cheat distance is go up and down and up and down. Now this is 10 inches here. This is 20 feet of 3 quarter inch ID uh, piping. So if, if I was to double this, I've got 40 feet of, of drying air, of, of giving my air the, the capacity to separate from the moisture uh, with this. And it also gives you the opportunity to mount a, uh, a ball valve or a drain valve down here and get the water out and be able to evacuate it so it doesn't fill up with water. So think your way through this stuff. You can cheat distance with something like this, plumb it up and down. You don't have to have a 50 foot wall. So keep that in mind when you're planning your airline system. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's start talking about spray guns. Um, before we go into demos on the guns, one of the questions that keeps coming up, and, and we've talked about this with the Eastwood guys before we planned this, this uh, presentation, is gun settings, air pressure settings. Yes, you have to have, uh, you have, to have the pressure set right, and the gun recommends uh, 10 pounds at the air cap. It almost makes me angry that the gun manufacturers uh, say 10 pounds at the air cap because for you and I, there's no way to verify that it's 10 pounds at the cap. There's not a gauge on the gun and there's not a gauge that fits on the inlet to gauge the air pressure at the cap. What you have to do is factor in the air inlet pressure right here. Now 10 pounds at the cap, a rule of thumb is that it's going to give you between 30 and 34 pounds at the inlet. So when they say 10 pounds at the air cap, just don't even worry about that. Worry about the inlet air pressure, which is the pressure coming in to the base of your gun. Now here's the thing too. People say, well I set my air pressure, but when I pull the trigger it, it goes all screwy. Well, when you set your air pressure, make sure your trigger is fully depressed and whether you've got a wall regulator or a regulator on your gun. Pull your trigger, let air going through it. Uh, pressure is set with the device completely open, so keep that in mind as well. Now, what am I doing with these things taped to my paint guns? <laughs> it looks kind of stupid, but there's a method to the madness here. These are what I call dry training guides, and they're perfect for, for learning gun handling techniques. Like I said right off the head, it's muscle memory, it's repetition, and these give you the opportunity to, to understand what it feels like to be in the awkward strain positions without even having a single bit of fluid go through your paint gun. Let me show you what I'm talking about. 
Now the bristles, the bristles of this brush represent where I want my spray gun on the surface. Now this right here, this is a Ferrari, just in case you were wondering. Now what I'm doing is I'm practicing my technique by keeping the bristles just barely touching the surface. And I can practice my overlap, and I can practice moving, I can do a rehearsal on the panel to see if I'm going to run over it, but the most important thing is that up here in my wrist, I'm getting a feel for how it feels when I'm in, in the right position in a nice comfort zone using correct technique. My wrist is, well, I'm going to go over here. My wrist is broken. It's not like that. I'm not sweeping. I'm going in a linear format and my wrist breaks. So the, the the brush on the end of the spray gun is a beautiful training tool and it's surprising how uh, effective it is for you to, to, it really sets the light bulb off to know exactly where your surface is in relationship to your spray gun. It takes a lot of the pressure off. Another great idea is this guy right here. The reason is sometimes it's easy to get lazy with our spray technique. Now, when I'm lazy, my spray pattern is like this when I'm just kind of pointing at the panel with the gun. And my pattern obviously is going to get really heavy down at the bottom and really light at the top and it's going to tiger stripe. It's going to be inconsistent. It's not going to be what I want. And this gives me the ability to test myself and keep my gun perpendicular to the surface, 90 degrees, spray pattern parallel to the surface. So again, it's a dry training guide that shows me if I'm off kilter one way or the other, and lets me memorize this natural position that I'm going to have the best painting results. So keep that in mind when you're spraying paint. Rehearse. Ron Covell talks about, <clears throat> excuse me, when he's welding, he does a rehearsal to get his, his comfort zone, to get his, his muscle memory built up before he starts painting and before he starts welding. And painting is absolutely no different. You want to be in a comfort zone. <clears throat> what I'm talking about with a comfort zone is I don't want to be out here going crazy painting out here. And, and I don't want to go over here like this. I want to have a zone to where I'm in control. Painting is all about control. You're controlling your air, your gun, your fluid, and your surface. So if I'm out here, if I'm out of control, I take a step, get in the comfort zone. So keep that in mind as well. Now I'm following an outline because we want to make sure and have time for your questions. So I'm going to be looking at this from time to time. Okay, so we've talked about spray gun technique. Let's talk about air hose technique. And why is that important? I'll show you. Another thing to consider, as well as your CFM on your uh, air compressor, is CFM in your air hose. I don't recommend anything longer than a 25 foot air hose because you, you, you experience pressure drop over distance. The other thing that's very, very important is to keep a 3 8 inside diameter airline and 3 8 ID fittings, to which these are not. These are 5 16 they're not 3 8 The difference between this and the, the professional spray gun setup that I've got in my booth is night and day. I have seen an inch difference in the, in the length of the spray pattern by going to 3 8 ID fittings. Very, very important for a good effective, uh, a good effective spray delivery. So what I'm talking about with the air hose this is, and nobody's going to do this really unless you forget. When I'm over here, guess what my air hose is doing? It's touching the panel. And at the very least, I'm knocking a bunch of trash into what I'm about to paint, or worst case scenario, I'm dragging my air hose into wet paint. Not good. So, this is what I recommend. Take your air hose, clip it over the shoulder. That's not good enough, because look what happens. It can come off of the shoulder, guide it with your other hand and you're using kind of a push-pull. You're controlling your environment. There goes my guide. And as I'm, you see what I'm doing? As I'm increasing my distance away from my body, I'm feeding the air hose. When I come back, I'm pulling it back. Take you a little while to get that memorized, but it's very important to do. So, just think your way through this stuff. It ain't rocket science, but it takes some thought and it takes some repetition. We're gonna put this over here. Let's talk about gun setup. Now that we know what we're going to paint, we know what we're going to paint with. And by the way, this is, this is the, uh, 
the Concourse gun from Eastwood. It's a very nice piece of gear. Uh, the Evolution guns are what you just saw. They're uh, very cost effective and they're nice guns. I used these guns on Jaded when I shot it. And um, I'm very happy with the results. Uh, sometimes even the best spray guns can get a goofy pattern just due to maintenance and stuff collecting into the air horns and things like that. So right here, this is a representation. This is an elliptical pattern. This is what you want to see. This is like a football shape and that's what you want to see out of your spray gun. Now, if it's like this, if it's heavy on each side and light in the middle, that means you're blowing it out with air pressure. You're cranked up too high. Um, some of the spray guns only want 20 pounds at the inlet. 20 to 30 pounds is typical. So you have the opportunity to test on some sort of a, a takeoff part or a piece of cardboard like this. Set your spray gun before you paint your car. Just like your welding, weld on a piece of scrap before you, you put your quarter panel in. So this one right here, this means it's heavy on one side, heavy on the other side, but it's, it's cyclical, it's, it's, it's curved like that. Typically what that means is that one of the air horns is blocked. These are the air horns on the spray gun tip. Now one of those might be crusted up and blocked. So, you know, it's a simple matter of cleaning it, but that's what that'll tell you. So, let's see. Oh, check this out too. This is the digital air pressure gauge. This thing's neat. If you got to have a pressure gauge on the end of your gun, this allows you to, uh, to adjust on the fly, and it's very accurate. So we're going to stick with a fairly low pressure. We're about 24 at the inlet. So let's do it. Let's give it a shot. So what do we got there? We have the perfect elliptical pattern. We've got the football right there, buddy. The reason we have that is because we're allowing the spray gun to do what it's designed to do. I've got the fan fully open. I've got the fluid delivery fully open. That's not to say you have to shoot like that all the time, but that's the optimal setup for me. Now we've got an air volume adjustment down at the bottom of the gun body, which is nice to have if you want to adjust on the fly if you're, if you're going into some, some tight recesses. It's nice to have that. And here's your fluid delivery, here's your fan. That's a fan, that's fluid delivery. So watch what happens when I tweak it. I want to improvise and... My pattern starts going away. And what's going to happen? See, <laughs> right there. It's going to run all over the place. You know, we're not doing uh, collages or, or, or art. We're, we're painting cars and we want a nice overlap. So uh, you can... If you've got a cylinder to get inside, it's really uncommon for me to recommend that you choke your, your fan pattern down. And it's very uncommon for me to, to recommend that you choke your fluid delivery down. Here's why. See what I'm doing there? It's misty. What's going to happen is I'm going to get a rough surface. I want a flat surface. I want the paint to flow out and self-level. So I want to make sure that I'm letting the expensive spray gun do what it's designed to do. Now, I know some of you guys are saying, this knucklehead is showing me how to spray paint that he doesn't have any safety equipment on. Here, I want to show you something. This is acrylic craft paint. I'm not being dangerous here. There's no overspray in the air because this is a high quality HVLP gun. It's not giving me overspray. And this is water-based craft paint. Now, when we do make some overspray, of course, I'm going to have a, uh, a mask on. So. Uh, I want to make sure that you understand that I'm doing this for demonstration purposes only and that it's a safe way to demonstrate these techniques to you guys. So always, always please keep safety in the forefront of your mind. These chemicals that we're using when it comes time to paint are dangerous and they're hazardous to handle as well as to ingest into our body. So please be careful. And this is actually a good tip for you guys as well. Get some craft paint. It's not that expensive. It's certainly not as expensive as automotive paint, and it allows you to play around with your equipment and set things up and, and get a feel for what you're doing. So let's talk, about, let's talk about overlap. What am I talking about with overlap? Now, it's a universal spray technique that you want a 50% overlap. What am I talking about with that? I've made a pass there. A 50% overlap means that I'm moving halfway down 50% from that pass and backtracking. So, this way. 50% down, overlap. 50% down, overlap. 
50% down, overlap. Now, I'm stopping and starting, and you can see what's happening as well. You don't want to do that because you get a heavy buildup on the edges. I stopped and started so I could talk to you guys and show you. But you don't stop and start with your fluid delivery when you're painting. You ease the trigger off because you can keep the air going at the same time as you're delivering, you're delivering paint. So here's your technique. It's not perfect, it's the first coat, it's black on a light substrate. So that's what I'm talking about with overlap, 50% overlap. You want, you want your vehicle to appear as though it's been dipped. You don't want random dry spots and a 50% overlap or some kind of an overlap helps you build that coat from one point to another point. So very, very important to perfect your overlap and pay attention to what you're doing. And the gun handling techniques will allow you to be in a nice comfortable position in your comfort zone while you're doing that. Speaking of comfort, your hand, this is your guide. This is what's, what your eyes are telling to move through your brain. So here is your standard prone position for a spray gun. If I want to paint up high like that on a van or something like that, if I keep the same hand position, it's goofy. I'm going to get a heavy pattern on one side. So here's something that I've learned over the years. You can change your hand position. See how my wrist is broken there? You can change your hand position to, to suit what you're trying to spray. So I've just adjusted my hand position, and as I'm coming down, I'm unlocking my wrist, and now I'm in the prone position. The same thing goes for getting down a little bit lower. Now, typically, I get down on my knees. I'm old. I'm old as dirt. My knees hurt. I don't want to get down on my knees on a concrete floor anymore. That was in my 20s. I'm not that anymore. So what I've also learned how to do is adjust my spray gun. Now, when I cup it like this, put my palm over top of the controls, now guess what I can do? I'm down here, and I've got a parallel pattern just like that. Perfect. So if I don't want to get down like this on my knees and get in my comfort zone, I can make a quick adjustment of my hand and go from the prone position to this position here and have perfect technique. So keep that in mind when you're moving around on a larger vehicle. So we've talked about overlap. We've talked about getting your gun set up properly. We've talked about, um, about proper techniques, handling your air hose. Here's something that's very important. I want to talk to you guys about sequencing a paint job. Here's the analogy. You want your car to appear as though it's been dipped as though you've grabbed the covers and pulled them up from your feet all the way up to your neck in one continuous coat. Um, sorry if that's goofy, that's just what it made me think of. But um, you have to sequence your paint job on a complete overall, uh, and this comes up an awful lot in, in the website forums that I, that I visit, the Eastwood Online Restoration Forum. Where do you stop, where do you start? Let's talk about how to sequence a paint job. Ken, did we decide to go over on that side? Are you okay there? Okay. Now, keep in mind, this is my RC Mustang. It's clear, and I'm going to be drawn all over it. So, obviously, in the spray booth, you can't move the car around, but this, this is what I'm talking about. Now, I always start on the roof of a vehicle in an overall. There's a couple of different reasons for that. Typically, your airflow is coming from the top down and creating an envelope around the vehicle, even in a semi-drown or a cross-draft paint booth, the top surfaces are going to get hit first. If I shoot the sides and then come up to do the top last, I've got wet paint here that I have the potential of messing up. So when I start here and then work my way around the vehicle and come up here, by the time I get back to the second coat on that top, well, it's probably dry enough for me to, to, to start again, and, and I don't risk messing up my sides anymore. So the sequence that I've learned over the years, I call, now this is in the Paint Education video series. I go into great detail in the videos to demonstrate this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it right here. Basically what I do is I start, I like the driver's side. I want to start on the driver's side, and I do what's called a push-pull method. I'm going to explain push-pull very clearly on our Ferrari right here. So what I do is step number one, I paint from the edge, from the drip rail to the middle. Now, a lot of guys start from the middle and work their way down. I don't like it. I don't like doing that because you get a dry spray in the middle and it stacks the paint up. So push. We push to the middle. And then we jump over to the other side. 
and we start from the middle where it's still wet, we grab that wet edge and drag it across. And that's step number two. Now I'm leapfrogging. I'm leapfrogging. That's what that means. You're going from side to side to side to side to side. And you're creating a wet surface that grows through the car. So step one, step two, I'm leapfrogging over back to the driver's side quarter panel. Then I paint my quarter. Typically I like to start from the bottom and work my way up because that allows me to push across the side. So I'll come up over here right to the sail panel and then I leapfrog over to the other quarter panel. And I paint from the bottom up not riding on my door gap. And I'll explain that in just a little bit. And I paint my other quarter panel, and because I've got a wet edge here that I was just at, now I can paint my way across that rear deck. Because I can reach it easily from the back bumper position, now I can catch up with my wet edge. Now that I've got this, I pick up the tail panel, and I paint the tail panel. Now I'm leapfrogging back again over to here. My edge here is still wet enough to where I pick up the door. And I spray my way up the door, getting past my panel gap. There's a really good reason for that. Past my panel gap. And it makes sense just to stop and start at the panel gap because it naturally breaks up the car. However, due to surface tension, you're going to have a heavy buildup on that gap. If you're doing a metallic or a candy, it can really, really bite you in the buns and make sure that you see that transition. And you don't want that. So I, pa I paint past my panel gaps. Then I leapfrog over to the other side. Hope you're getting the picture. And we paint our way up this door again. Again, past our panel gap. So now what we've got is what's called the doghouse. It's the front end of the car. This edge is still wet because I was over there less than a minute ago. But it's dry enough now to pick up the wet edge and I work my way forward. So I pick up the fender, work my way around the wheel, and I push my way across the hood the same way that I did on the roof. And this is the push-pull method. You push to the middle, and then you pick up the middle on the other side. You walk around, pick it up, and you pull it from the wet edge, and you keep it a continuous overlap all the way down until you've come all the way across the doghouse. And this edge here is so wet enough that you can, you can have this continuous coating. And if you've got a, a lower fascia, a grill, pick up your dry edges there, and you've got one continuous coat on that paint job that looks like it has no dry spots, there's no transitions, and you know where to go. And typically, by the time you work your way around a car, it takes 30 to 40 minutes to do a single coat on a car. Well, there's your flash time. So t then you can go into the spray booth, mix your, gu your cup again, and start over. Start with your second coat or your third coat. So that's how I like to sequence a paint job. Now here's another demonstration. Go back over to this hot rod here. And we do have a little bit of time. Okay, so I'm coming over here. If I stop right here, here's what that gap looks like. That's looking down at that door. Now my paint is going to bubble up here. It's going to get really heavy right there. You've seen this on cars, on original equipment cars. So if you stop and start right here, you're just accentuating that, and you're building up crazy layers of paint right here, right on that gap. You don't want to do that. You want to, the first coat, maybe you spray up till here. When you come back around for your second coat, stretch it over to here. On your third coat, back it off over to here. Make sure you're getting three full coats. Change the position of that. That will really help you, especially with translucent colors or candies. That is a, uh, that's a great technique. Um, if you're working a candy, you walk the side. That's, a, that's an advanced technique. But this right here will keep you from having runs in the gaps. Nobody likes the runs. No different in painting.